Hello, and welcome to Face to Face. Our guest today is uh, David Orchard. Um, I don't want to embarrass David, but he's somebody who's been a hero of mine for a long time. I've, uh, I've sort of watched some of the great things he's done over the last 20 years, uh, 20, 30 years. I don't know how long you've been at it, David. Um, we're going to be talking about quite a few different issues today. And I just want to say that David Orchard is, uh, is an example of the power of the media. Because when I say that name, most of you are probably going to think, David Orchard, you know, where have I heard that name before? Well, he's somebody who, who really has done great stuff in and for this country for a long time. And yet he gets, uh, let's say, one hundredth the coverage of uh, Brittany or Paris or Swine Flu or, um, or the Vancouver Canucks, for that matter. So, David, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, Jack. Thanks. Um, I want to start with something you just showed me, which is uh, you ran for the leadership of the Conservative Party. The Progressive Conservative Party. The Progressive Party. Conservative Party. How long ago? That was, uh, I ran first in 1998, uh, and I was runner-up to Joe Clark in that race. And then in 2003, I ran, uh, and that was the race in which Peter McKay uh, ended up uh, winning. So I ran twice for the leadership of the old Progressive Conservative Party, yeah. Peter McKay won. He is now the uh, Minister of Defense of our nation uh, in the Conservative government. Yeah. But he beat you for the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party. And in fact, you supported him uh, at the end mm -hmm. um, because it was clear that you were not going to win. Yes. You supported him on the promise that he would what? Well, you're right. We went into that convention uh, in, in Toronto with the second largest number of delegates. Peter McKay had the largest number, and I had the second largest number, and then uh, and Jim Prentice and Scott Bryson and others were, were running. But as the ballots went on, the, the one who was on the bottom is forced off. And so uh, when Scott Bryson was forced off, he went and supported Jim Prentice. And then together they passed me, so I, had, I was going to be forced off, so I had to choose if I was going to back Peter McKay or Jim Prentice. Now, Mr. Prentice had openly talked about merging the, the, with the Canadian Alliance, uniting the right, and uh, I was opposed to that. Mr. McKay had campaigned all through the leadership race saying he was opposed to uniting the right. He was going to build the Progressive Conservative Party into a major force and that it was a progressive party, not uh, a far right-wing party uh, like the Alliance was. And so we got together and we uh, made an agreement. I agreed that we would back him. Uh, on the basis of four points, and we wrote them down, and uh, that's the document that I, that I showed you. And the main point was that he would not, he would not merge the Progressive Conservative Party with what was then the Alliance. And who was the who was the leader of the Alliance at that time? Well, there was there was there was there was Stockwell Day, and then Stephen Harper became the the, the leader after. Uh, now our Prime Minister. Uh, yes, but what the, yes the point one of our agreement was no merger, joint talks, or. Uh, no merger with the Canadian Alliance. We would r maintain the integrity of the Progressive Conservative Party in every riding in the country, as was provided for in the Constitution of our party. And the, the document also called for a Blue Ribbon Commission to review the impact of the Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA, and to put environmental policies front and center, including increased use of rail to cut pollution. So that was the document we signed. We and he signed that document, agreeing to do all of those things. He signed it, and, okay. and, and I, we have we have the document. I'll just uh, put it up on the screen here. Um, Mr. McKay's signature is at the bottom. He promised, he agreed not to merge the two parties and to do other things. He is now the Minister of Defense of our nation. Shortly after, well, we signed that document, we went down on the convention floor and held a press conference and made the document public. And uh, then it was uh, later published in, I think, every major newspaper in the country. But within the matter of, uh, of a few weeks, uh, Mr. McKay was negotiating with Mr. Harper and he signed the party over to, to, uh, to Mr. Harper, who then became the, uh, uh, the uh, leader of this, this joint, uh, joint, uh, joint party. And so... That was a blatant betrayal of what Mr. McKay had campaigned on. It was a blatant betrayal of all the members of the Progressive Conservative Party who had put that provision into the Constitution to prevent a takeover by the Alliance because we wanted to be a, a moderate party, not a party of the extreme right. And, of course, it was a betrayal of, of what he had signed with me. And so, you know, I had a press conference and I called the, the merger with the Canadian Alliance a, a, a union conceived in deception and born in betrayal. And uh, that uh, is how the new Conservative Party, so-called, of Canada got its beginnings. 
And as you say, um, he is now the uh, leader of our troops in Afghanistan as Minister of Defense. And uh, as Mr. Harper and Mr. McKay always like to say, we're pushing democracy in Afghanistan. And, and you, can, you can see, folks, how democracy is run by these people. Well, the idea of introducing democracy by bombing a country, it doesn't fly. We, they, they tell us we're going to help the women and girls in Afghanistan. Well, bombing their country, and in the United States is using depleted uranium weapons. They used massive amounts of them in Iraq, and they're using them in Afghanistan. They used them in the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999. This is going to leave, leave a legacy of agony and destruction. Just a tiny little speck of depleted uranium inhaled into the lungs uh, is essentially a death sentence. So this idea that we're going to be helping the people by bombing them with these kind of weapons uh, is, uh, is a clear falsehood, and I've written a number of articles uh, about why we should not be in Afghanistan. Maybe you can just mention your website so people can get in touch with you. Yes, my website is davidorchard.com. Anybody can uh, go and have a look at the articles that have covered a span of, as you mentioned, some decades uh, at davidorchard.com. Now, David, you just mentioned depleted uranium, and that's an issue that really gets no coverage in the media. And, uh, you know, I mean, depleted uranium is is it's a deadly, deadly poison. And yet, my understanding is, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit, that it has been spread around the Middle East and in Yugoslavia by the American military, and I guess the Canadian military as well. Are we using depleted uranium now? Well, this is a very good question. The Canadian military says that they're not using depleted uranium now, uh, but the United States admits openly that they, they, uh, they do. Now, I spoke out against the bombing of Yugoslavia. In 1999, the NATO countries, some 30-odd countries, including Canada, began bombing uh, essentially a helpless country of, of what, uh, Yugoslavia. And they, the Americans were using depleted uranium there. And I wrote an article that was published in the Globe and Mail uh, calling, uh, saying that this was a war essentially to bomb Yugoslavia into the era of globalization because Yugoslavia had a... Uh, a mixed economy, public and private ownership. They had their own automobile, their own aviation industry. They refused to privatize everything holus bolus. So they angered uh, uh, some people in the West, including uh, the, prime, the president of the United States, Bill Clinton. And so I wrote a piece against the bombing, and I had a sentence in there about the use of depleted uranium. The Global Mail published my piece, and they cut out the sentence about depleted uranium. So I phoned and said, "How did you? you why did you do that? Because as you mentioned, there's almost no." mention in our media about the use of, of this deadly, deadly weaponry. And the Globe told me, well, you can't prove it, that it's, it's being used. And I said, well, the Pentagon themselves have admitted it. They've, they, it's, it's an open fact that the USA-10 Warthog aircraft is they're, they're using depleted uranium ammunition. And what they do is they use depleted uranium to coat the missiles and, and to harden them. And so they cut through the enemy tanks like butter is the phrase they use. But when it impacts, when it bursts into flame, the, the, the tiny uh, specks and fragments vaporize and they, they go all over and they can be, uh, be uh, inhaled by the population, and the ra rates of cancer in Iraq since the, the, the war have, are astronomical, and of course the rates of cancer and other diseases in, in the former Yugoslavia as well. And the, the Americans used depleted uranium in Yugoslavia, they used massive amounts of it in Iraq, they're using it now in Afghanistan. And so even if Canada is not using it, we are there as allies of a country that is using it. And the idea that that any, you know, in, in, in Yugoslavia, they said, well, this is a humanitarian bombing. We're bombing to actually help the people of Yugoslavia to stop ethnic cleansing. Well, it turns out there wasn't ethnic cleansing going on, but they're going to live with the legacy of that bombardment for all eternity. And this is a horrific situation that many people don't know about. It's, and it's a kind of a, there's a blanket of silence in our media about the fact that this, this horrific weaponry is being used and it's going to be deadly for all time. Like, depleted uranium is, comes out of the, the, uh, the nuclear reactors, it's much more deadly than the uranium going in. It contains a whole range of compounds, including plutonium, named after the Greek god of, of hell. These substances will last for a million years in the environment. So that's the danger that we have. And there's a movement around the world to ban depleted uranium. Brussels has now banned it, and they won't allow ships containing, containing uh, weapons containing depleted uranium into their harbors. This movement has to grow. Canada says that they've stopped using it, uh, but we have to raise this issue wherever we can. 
You know, there are some things that really do defy the imagination almost, and the use of depleted uranium is one of them. I mean, it seems to be so far outside the bounds of even of sanity yeah. because it is insane. This stuff will go around the world. In fact, I've read that when the Americans began bombing Iraq at the beginning of their last war with depleted uranium, it, it showed up over Britain uh, within a couple of days in higher, in elevated readings. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that as well. This is the kind of destruction of our environment. I grew up... Uh, uh, our own troops are there. Our own troops are there and they're suffering from it. Uh, I grew up uh, when the Vietnam War was raging and I remember reading in the Reader's Digest a, a story called The Blood Red Hands of Ho Chi Minh. They talked about how terrible the Vietnamese uh, were and how the Americans were introducing democracy to Vietnam. Well, it's the truth finally came out that little Vietnam wasn't threatening anyone. They had no air force to threaten the United States. They were a small country that for 10,000 years hadn't invaded anybody. They were just trying to hang on to their country. But here was the mightiest power on earth bombing them. And of course, the Americans used Agent Orange, a mixture of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. I had a chance to visit Vietnam about 12 or 13 years ago, and they have hospitals full of people. They've got over two million people that have been damaged in the most horrific way by Agent Orange. They have people that are called jelly babies, they're, 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 they have no, their, their spines are, are, are deformed, they've got people with all kinds of incredible deformities. The Americans promised at the end of the war that they would pay some kind of reparations. They haven't done so, but that's one of the legacies that the Vietnamese are dealing with. And now, this de depleted uranium legacy is what's going to be dealt with by the future generations in, in Iraq, in Yugoslavia, in Afghanistan, and as you mentioned, all the troops that are there, the Canadian troops, a good part of this Gulf War syndrome that we hear about in the United States, many uh, researchers are, are making the link between that and the use of depleted uranium, and these, all these unexplained maladies that are showing up in the servicemen after they come back from their, their tours in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is, if we're claiming to help the people of the area with our actions, you can't use weaponry that is this, this horrific and it's going to come back to haunt our people, our men and women serving over there, and of course all of the uh, civilians and the residents of these countries. You know, I just want to go back to that sentence that you, you put a sentence into your story on uh, Yugoslavia mentioning depleted uranium and the Globe and Mail took it out. Mm. That's, that's just an example of the way our media works. The media in this country, we have to face it folks, has, is totally corrupt. I mean, for something like this depleted uranium nightmare to be going on and to never have it mentioned, when our, old, our own soldiers are there being exposed to it in, in Afghanistan, because the Americans are using it, and it's a threat to the entire planet, as well as to the poor millions of people who live there who have to deal with it, and yet there's no mention. It's as if it doesn't exist. You know, this nuclear issue, you know, is, is a big issue because Saskatchewan is the leading supplier of uranium to the United States. Which and, means Canada. Which means Canada. So we, in my view, have a responsibility to know what's going on and to know what's happening with all of that uranium that's coming out of Canada and going to the uh, United States military uh, machine. So that's why I feel, one of the reasons I feel so strongly that we have to alert people to what is happening. And of course, uh, this nuclear fuel cycle, they want to now expand the use of nuclear power. They're calling it a safe and renewable form of power. They don't talk about the waste that comes out of these nuclear reactors. And every state in the United States has said, no, they don't want uh, the nuclear waste. Nevada was going to put it in, uh, in Yucca Mountain there, but uh, the people of Nevada don't want it, so uh, the President Obama has stopped the funding, so now they're looking for a place to put it. And uh, the, they would like to bury it underground. They're looking at northern Saskatchewan, looking at different places across uh, Canada where they could bury it. Now, if that stuff is buried underground, that waste, it's deadly, as I mentioned, for a million years. It'll leak and it'll get into the groundwater and then we'll be bequeathing that to our future generations. And uh, this is something that we cannot allow to happen. But the issue about nuclear power and its connection to the, to the weapons is something, as you pointed out, that's not very often spoken about.
And really, I guess what they're doing with these depleted uranium weapons is that they're simply taking that waste and getting rid of it around the world. That's right. It's it's a way to. Uh, in fact, my understanding is that the, that some of the, part of the the nuclear reactor the, the operators are are giving it free to the U.S. Department of Defense because it's a way. Yes, it's a way of of getting getting rid of it, but. Uh, at what cost? They don't care. They obviously don't care. This is why it's important that we have to uh, raise this issue from the public, from the grassroots, in the same way that the opposition to the Vietnam War grew and uh, the exposure about Agent Orange and those uh, deformities. Many American servicemen were damaged by Agent Orange as well. And now it's our generation's job to raise the issue of what's happening with depleted uranium. I mean, this is truly, you have to say, it's beyond insanity to be doing, to be spreading this kind of waste in, in I mean, uh, 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 folks, I honestly do not know what you can say about this kind of thing. I don't know if, you see, if, if some people don't see the importance of it, but this is a nightmare. We have to uh, protect our planet. Uh, the, the kind of, the way in which we've dealt with it in the past is catching up to us rapidly. This, this, the use of, uh, of, uh, of the, the whole disposal of nuclear waste, for example. Greenpeace caught these companies dumping it in the ocean a few years ago. Uh, well, it's a few decades ago now. So then they thought, well, what will we do? And somebody, then they thought, maybe well, they'll put it in a rocket and shoot it up to outer space. Somebody said, well, that rocket could explode on the way up. So they kiboshed that idea, but now they're talking, as I say, about burying it underground, which could be very, very dangerous as well. And, uh, you know, this, that, that's, uh, that's a big topic. The whole issue of what the nuclear industry is doing to our environment, but the whole issue of what pesticides and uh, herbicides and sprays are doing to our environment is a big one as well. And that's, of course, what took me into, into organic farming some 30 odd years ago. So you've been an organic farmer for 30 years. In what part of Saskatchewan? Well, my farm, I have two farms, one at Borden, which is in uh, central Saskatchewan, uh, north central Saskatchewan, and uh, uh, the other one is at Choiceland. And yes, I've been an organic farmer since 1975. And the reason, I'm the fourth generation on our farm. Our farm was founded in 1904 by my grandfather and great-grandfather. But the reason I went to organic farming is I read a book by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. And I read that book in 1969 or 70. And in her book, she traces the development of these pesticides and herbicides that we use. And she points out that many of them were originally developed as biological warfare agents uh, in Nazi Germany. Uh, they were designed originally to kill people and then after the war they made that so-called transition to peaceful use and we're now spraying a variant of these uh, as herbicides and pesticides insecticides on food that we eat across the planet so I didn't want to be part of uh, damaging the environment I didn't want to be part of, uh, of uh, putting our own lives at, uh, at, at risk or to the people who eat, eat our food so my brothers and I changed the farm over to an organic operation in 1975, and we've been organic ever since. So I farm uh, about 3,000 acres, and I keep a third of my farm in a natural prairie and forest. So I have about 1,000 acres that I keep uh, as prairie and as forest, and it's habitat for, I've got wild elk and moose and deer and wolves and bear and sandhill cranes, and it's it's w makes farming interesting to be able to go out and see those those animals and, and to know that you're farming in a way that's not damaging the environment, that's not putting poisons, uh, 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 killing the wildlife, and it's not damaging the food that people are going to eat at, at the other end. And you're not in hock to the chemical and pesticide companies for your fertilizer and your sprays every year because you can farm with far fewer inputs as an organic uh, uh, operator. So, uh, so organic farming has, uh, has turned out to be one of the bright spots in the agricultural, uh, agricultural landscape because many, many farmers have been having a real struggle to survive. The farms are getting bigger and bigger. We've got farms in Saskatchewan are 10,000 acres, 20,000 acres, as far as the eye can see. Uh, but organic farming is a way smaller farmers, uh, you can have more people on the land, smaller farmers can get a higher return, and you're not damaging the environment either. You know, to me, it, it seems like we should be, as a, as a country, and probably most Canadians would like to do this, is seeing the family farm succeed. Yes. And getting, you know, not, not getting bigger in terms of size, but getting bigger in, in terms of more people being able to do it. Yes, and, and giving more jobs to people. Many people yeah. would like to be able to farm. And uh, uh, this was one of the, 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 the policies that we promoted, uh, that I promoted in the old Progressive Conservative Party. And, uh, and uh, I would like to see 
a transition. The government could, could make, help farmers make a transition to organic farming. Because I get calls all the time. People want to know, how can I make the transition? How can I become an organic farmer? Because I'm sick of having a, a fertilizer and a pesticide bill of $100,000 or more every year. So, so uh, there are ways to do it. And it doesn't necessarily involve subsidies. Many of the European countries are giving subsidies to their farmers to move them to, to organic or sustainable agriculture. But even if our government would start by just explaining some of the basics to farmers, how they can make the transition, because you have to be three years away from chemicals before you can be certified as organic. Just some basic information. And then we need research because almost all of the research that's done at our universities now in terms of agriculture is funded in some way or supported by some of the big chemical companies. So it's no surprise when they come up with new chemicals to solve every new problem that you might have. We need research that's done, uh, funded by the, by the government, funded publicly to show, to help solve problems without using chemicals and pesticides that are causing such horrendous health problems. You know, in, in, in her book, Rachel Carson talked about in 1900, in, in North America, one in 10 people contracted cancer. The statistics now are more than one in three. In fact, they're almost one in two. Almost 50% of the population of North America is going to get cancer. This is an epidemic of untold consequences. And what is causing why are so many people getting cancer? We've had this war on cancer uh, going on for years, and yet the rate is, is simply going up and up and up. Something is causing this cancer of the population. And, uh, and when you look at some of the impact of these pesticides and herbicides, there's no doubt that it's, it's having serious health impacts. So uh, it's, I'm happy to see Ontario has recently passed a, a bylaw dramatically restricting the use of uh, uh, pesticides and herbicides uh, in, in, in Ontario. And, and so there's been some 80 cities that have passed bylaws against the cosmetic use of pesticides. These bylaws can't come fast enough as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's funny, our daily newspaper, The Times Colonist, uh, because we're thinking of doing the same thing here in Victoria, they just ran an editorial saying, oh, wait a second, we're, this is a little bit too much. Let's, uh, let's stop and think. There really is, you know, maybe there's some concern about cancer, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's our daily paper, The Times Colonist. I don't think it was even written here, but, you know, the people who run the paper at some level, uh, obviously... Uh, support the chemical industry. This is a big issue and we had the same debate in, in Saskatoon and actually uh, it didn't it didn't pass so we haven't got our bylaw yet but many cities are doing it and I hope you will do this uh, in Victoria because the uh, the, 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 the medical uh, uh, profession in has played a major role in Ontario in terms of pointing out some of the health impacts of these chemicals and, and, the, and these uh, these pesticides, and uh, when you the, the when you look at the impact that a spray uh, has on a weed, the chemical coal company used to run ads bragging about how the weed would burn itself out in a matter of 48 hours and would have tumors on its roots after it had been sprayed. Well, all life we're made up of basically similar uh, uh, DNA, and what's affecting those weeds, uh, it's turning out, is also affecting the children and the men and women uh, and the wildlife that uh, also lives here. So that's why we have to be very, very careful uh, about these pesticides, and the, the quicker we can restrict their use uh, and the exposure of the population to them, uh, the, 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 be the better we're going to be. But, you know, Dow Chemical is a big manufacturer of uh, pesticides and they've, uh, uh, they're threatening to sue. They're already suing uh, uh, Quebec for its ban on the cosmetic use of pesticides and they've threatened to sue Ontario now saying that this contra under chapter 11 of NAFTA they have the right to sue for any law or regulation in Canada which they, they feel causes them loss or damage. So under chapter 11 of NAFTA they are suing uh, to overturn. They are actually suing. Yeah. They're already suing Quebec and they've threatened now to sue Ontario. Well, Ontario's bylaw just went into effect, I think, about 10 days ago. Now, of course, this is another thing that gets virtually zero coverage in the media because the media does not want the people of Canada to be outraged when these foreign corporations sue us because we're trying to protect our lives. They have the right under these agreements that they've signed, these corporate free trade agreements like NAFTA, signed by our government without the support of the public, and then they sue us. Well, it was this whole free trade issue uh, that uh, actually uh, uh, we began in 1985, a group of us uh, uh, battling against the so-called free trade agreement. That's how I came, I guess, to public notice uh, uh, 
in, in this country. A, a group of us met, uh, myself, Mary Lena Repo, and others, and we formed an organization to let people know about the free trade agreement, what was what was in it, because people weren't aware of what was uh, what was in the agreement, and we had a hundred public meetings across Canada in that 87, 88 period uh, to explain to people what's in the free trade agreement and uh, uh, how it's going to hurt Canada. And I wrote a book actually about it, uh, about the history of our relationship with the United States, our battle to survive uh, uh, next to the to the superpower, the various attempts from the United States to. Take Take control of Canada. The book came out in 1993. But uh, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement went into effect in 1988. Then NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which expanded the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement to Mexico and made a few changes. Under the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, for example, we agreed to send the same proportion of any energy good across the border to the United States that they were taking even if there was a shortage in Canada. And we would never charge the Americans more for any energy than we charge Canadians. We agreed that we could never restrict American foreign investment coming into, into our country. So we've seen some 12,000 Canadian companies taken over by American corporations uh, since that agreement was signed. And, uh, and we're seeing our oil and our, our petroleum resources going south uh, and Canadians now have to pay the world price. Uh, that's one of the reasons why our, the price of our energy has gone so high is we've signed away our energy under the, under the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. But under NAFTA, uh, there's a chapter, Chapter 11, which allows American corporations, not Canadian corporations, but uh, U.S. corporations to sue the Canadian government for any law or regulation in Canada which they feel causes them loss or damage or which they feel contravenes the spirit of the free trade agreement. And uh, this, uh, as you mentioned, this allows... U.S. corporations to sue the Canadian government, but not Canadian corporations. So we've given greater powers to U.S. corporations in Canada than we have to Canadian companies. On the other hand, Canadian corporations can now sue the United States government in the United States. And I think uh, Canadian corporations, I mean, they're not ours, but these evil Canadian corporations have done it there while they're doing it here. There has been a, an attempt by several Canadian companies to sue in the United States. They've been almost uh, universally unsuccessful, whereas the American corporations, uh, I mean, size matters, eh? And the U.S. corporations have been able to dictate uh, a whole range of laws uh, in Canada by threatening these lawsuits. You know, when, for example, when Canada banned MMT, this uh, gasoline additive that Mr. Kretschen called a horrific neurotoxin, Canada, when Canada went to ban it, the, the U.S. head office sued the Canadian government uh, and uh, under NAFTA Chapter 11 and overturned the ban and got paid compensation, some $20 million in compensation for having bothered them. That's just one example. Is MMT still used? In yes. Our it's still easier. They don't what did Mr. Kretien call it? He called it a, hor a horrific neurotoxin because he was talking about its effect on the human, human nervous system. And yet it's, it's not used in Europe. It's been banned in most places in the United States. But under NAFTA, the, this uh, U.S. Head, head office was able to sue Canada and get it back into the gasoline here. And in fact, a U.S. health uh, study was being done and they came up to Toronto to test Torontonians uh, who are breathing the uh, the uh, the exhaust coming out of the tailpipes of cars that contained uh, uh, gasoline containing MMT. So this it's this provision of NAFTA Chapter 11 under which uh, Dow Chemical is now suing Quebec for its ban on. Uh, the cosmetic use of pesticides, and, and Dow is threatened under Chapter 11 to sue uh, Ontario for for the for the for their pesticide uh, bylaw. And what those pesticide bylaws say is that uh, within a town or city, you can't use pesticides to just get rid of weeds on your lawn because it's not important if there's weeds on your lawn or not. You can dig them out by hand, but they you know the the, the populace does not want you spraying poisons all over the place that everybody has to deal with. So that, that, that uh, bylaw is in place in Quebec and Quebec is now being sued by Dow Chemical. Or Actually, Quebec done. is going to, uh, under the NAFTA agreement, they have to sue the Canadian government. So, the, uh, so Dow is suing Canada to make Canada, uh, compel Canada to make Quebec reverse its, uh, its bylaw because under NAFTA, it's any law or regulation from any level of government 
whether it's municipal, provincial, or federal, that the uh, U.S. Uh, corporation can, uh, can, can challenge. So would they sue the Canadian government to force them to tell Quebec to change its bylaw? Now, this is never in the media because uh, the media is owned by the people who do not want you to know about these kinds of things. These are the kinds of things that are generally kept secret while they fill us with crime, violence, uh, entertainment, sports, and all those things are, you know, at least entertainment and sports are fun too. But uh, they use it to hide and keep secret the important things that we should be knowledgeable about because these are life and death issues. Well, it's, uh, there has been some coverage in the media about this uh, lawsuit by Dow, uh, Dow uh, Chemical. Not enough, uh, I grant you. Uh, but Not as much as the Canucks are getting, I'll bet. <laughs> no, that, that's right. Not as much as the Octomom gets. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that, that's right. And, uh, but, you know, our, our press has been full the last few months about this global economic meltdown. And, uh, you know, we've seen what's happening to, to uh, corporations. Uh, uh, we've seen what's happened to banks uh, uh, in many countries in the world. This is really the chickens coming home to roost from this uh, free trade globalization era that we've lived through. You know, for the last 20 years, we've had this unending praise of the virtues of privatization, deregulation, and free trade. We were told that this was going to bring higher standard of living to all Canadians. We'd have more jobs. Brian Mulroney promised famously jobs, jobs, jobs when he was uh, introducing his free trade agreement. And uh, now, what's, what's happened? We're seeing more and more of our raw resources going south. For example, we're seeing raw logs going south out of British Columbia here in Alberta. Almost all that petroleum out of the tar sands going south to the United States at less than 1% royalty. We're getting almost nothing in the way of royalties out of that uh, tar sands petroleum, but we're getting all of the pollution that's staying here in Canada, the Mackenzie uh, Delta, the Athabasca, the river, the, the damage that's being done. And as I mentioned, we're seeing, we've seen the takeover of thousands and thousands of Canadian companies, even CN Rail, our national rail line, is now uh, major U.S. owned. We've seen the privatization of, uh, of our uh, companies that were iconic Canadian companies now uh, moved into, in, into foreign hands. The entire steel industry, for example, in Ontario has moved into foreign hands. And now they want to take the grain industry. We've got the Canadian Wheat Board that's w the one institution that's helping to keep the Canadian grain trade which is a $6 billion annual trade, to keep that in Canadian hands. But Mr. Harper is doing everything he can to dismantle the Canadian Wheat Board. But where has it bought us? It's bought us down to the, uh, the globalization has now been thoroughly discredited. It's those countries that have looked after their own industries, protected their own industries, and refused to open themselves wide to let uh, these giant transnationals come in. They're the ones that have done the best. Under this policy of free trade, for example, Alberta has been pumping oil resources south for 40-some years, more than that, actually. And where are they left with? Alberta is now in deficit, whereas Norway has had a policy of keeping their oil industry in Norwegian hands, and they don't spend any of that money from the, uh, to run their country. They consider it a one-time windfall, and they think it should be saved and spread over the future generations. So Norway has saved $400 billion in their heritage fund uh, from their oil uh, resources, and Canada hasn't saved a penny. So Norway now has passed us on the scale of the best countries in the world to live, has a higher, higher standard of living than Canada. We could have all of these things in, in, in Canada, but we can't if we just uh, say, okay, we're going to, it's, it's free trade, it's globalization, we're going to give away all of, our, all of our companies. Like, we should have, for example, now we're going to give billions of dollars to the foreign-owned automobile industry, try to bail out GM, Chrysler, and all the rest. What about the idea of a Canadian car? If we're going to put that kind of money into foreign-owned industries over which we have no control over their future or their, or their decisions. We could have build a Canadian automobile here, design created here. We already have good electric cars created in, in Canada. We've got the Zen car and others, but we haven't had any kind of policy that's allowed that to happen because they say, oh, that's protectionism. But any country in the world that has arisen to become a major power has protected their industries. Japan, for example, protected t Toyota for 35 years before they were strong enough to go out and compete on the world stage. The British, when they ruled the waves, they protected their industries, their textile industries and others until they were able to conquer the world. The Americans have protected their film industry, their defense industries, all the industries that they used to spread around the world. And 
countries much smaller than Canada have their own automobile. For example, Korea, Japan, Italy. Uh, these com countries have been able to create their and find foster an automobile in industry. So I think what we could do with all the resources we have here, with the technology, with the man and woman power that we've got here, I'd like to see us have a Canadian automobile that would give pride to people across Canada. And in terms of our oil and gas industry, for example, the Maritimes, Quebec, and most of Ontario are forced to import oil, offshore oil from the Middle East and from Venezuela because we have no east-west pipeline in Canada. So we've got the western oil from Saskatchewan, Alberta, going straight south to the United States for peanuts, as I mentioned, and we don't even have a link over to the Maritimes and, and to Quebec so that they can be secure. Even though we call ourselves an energy superpower, uh, the, 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 almost half the country isn't secure at all, so we need to have a, a pipeline so that the whole country can feel secure. And in terms of electricity, I've been advocating an electrical power grid across the country because when Ontario had a blackout, for example, Quebec just next door to them have lots of power. They're trying to export it into the United States. Manitoba's trying to export their, their power into the United States, but there wasn't even a link between those provinces. And so Ontario had to buy expensive, dirty, coal-fired power from the United States to try to get out of its blackout. Just because we don't even have an east-west electrical grid. Mr. Diefenbaker talked about that in 1960, trying to crea create uh, such a thing. Well, what sense does it make for, for Canada as a nation not to have an east-west electrical grid? Why don't we have that? Well, what happened when Mr. Diefenbaker introduced the idea was the provincial premier said, well, this is, this is our jurisdiction, Hydro-Quebec and, uh, and uh, Manitoba Hydro and all of these are provincial utilities and we're not going to let the feds uh, interfere at all. It's going to interfere in our jurisdiction. But it's, it's crazy. So we've got each province now is linked, their hydro system is linked more closely to the U.S., to the south of them, than it is east and west. So we've got Quebec Hydro linked into the United States. We've got Manitoba Hydro uh, linked into the U.S. without that link uh, across. And now each of the provinces is trying to be self-sufficient. My province, Saskatchewan, is now talking about building a nuclear reactor, for heaven's sake, uh, you know, for some $14 billion. In fact, one of the sites they're talking about building it is right close to my farm on the North Saskatchewan River. When we could, we're not short of power, because they're, they're going to use most of that power simply to export to the United States or to power the tar sands. We could simply stick a line over to Manitoba, which has an excess of power. So, and Newfoundland has an excess of power they're trying to sell in Quebec. Think of what that would do for our country in terms of binding us together, making us feel more secure, making us, letting us know that we all had access to this powerful uh, electrical grid that, so that every Canadian could be assured of, uh, of, a, of a fair and decent uh, supply of electricity. And it would be cheaper than, than provinces trying to build horrendously expensive in installations like nuclear power reactors, which is what Ontario is talking about building more of. So it would be cheaper, it would tie the country together, it would give us a greater sense of vision and unity, uh, and, uh, and it would make, uh, make more sense. But we don't have it yet. But that's an idea that I've been promoting for, for a long time, and I'm glad to see now the Liberal Party has picked up that idea and they're talking about it, but we need to have public pressure to make it happen. Well, it, it seems like we're so far behind. I mean, why doesn't it already exist? Yes, that's a very good, uh, very good question. Part it's, it's partly to do with this idea that we're focused north-south, north-south. So we've got more trade going north-south now than we have going <coughs> east-west. And the, and the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement that I mentioned and NAFTA cement that kind of logic into place so that we're we're, uh, we're, we're, we've committed our energy resources, we've, uh, we've let our corporations slip out of Canadian hands, uh, and if we're going to do that, we're not going to control our destiny. I'm, I'm a farmer, and if somebody else owns my farm, uh, they get to make the decision about what, decisions about what happens. And the same thing happens with a nation. No great nation has ever arisen ar uh, relying on foreign ownership. John A. Macdonald made the point that no great power has ever arisen whose policy was free trade, because that generally means letting this, the superpower of the era come and take your resources. And that's why countries who have smart countries like Japan or like Korea or like Norway have looked after their industries. They haven't allowed them to be uh, taken out of the country and they haven't uh, lost those engines uh, uh, of growth and the engines that's allowed them to develop their, their, their economy. It sounds like you're saying that everything we've been doing for the last 30 
years has really made no sense. I mean, I, I, that's how I feel, that these whole free trade agreements are not for the benefit of Canada or Canadians. They're for the benefit of the corporations. And our governments, who should be working for us, are working for these corporations and signing these deals, which are no good for us. I mean, why do we sign deals that let all of our jobs be offshored? And that's all being coming out in the wash now with this glo so-called global economic meltdown. We saw what happened when we let the steel industry go, and the U.S. Steel comes in and takes control of our uh, some of our major steel plants, and then they promptly lay off uh, lay off the, the, the workers. And the same is same is happens when you have simply foreign ownership of your industries. It makes sense they're going to shut down these ones before they're going to shut down the ones at home. That's why nations have insisted on having it, their own industries and that's why I've called for a national industrial strategy in Canada so we used to have Massey Harris Massey Ferguson the world's uh, Canada's greatest multinational I still run Massey combines on my farm it's an excellent combine all of those farm machinery industries the major farm machinery industries are practically foreign owned now and uh, when when that happens you end up paying a much higher price as a farmer to buy those uh, buy those machines every time you need parts you have to pay pay a higher price and Canadians aren't getting getting the job and so that's uh, that's why I've opposed these so-called free trade agreements because they're not free trade. They say, well, it's going to allow freer trade back and forth. Since we signed the free trade agreement, we've had tariffs on our softwood lumber, as you know, here in BC. We've had tariffs on grain exports. We've had restrictions against a whole number of, of exports. So it hasn't given us free trade, but it has allowed U.S. industry to come in and buy up lock, stock, and barrel our industries. We've totally lost our garment industry, which used to be huge in this country. We, we, we can't make clothing anymore in one of the coldest countries in the world because we can't compete with China or Haiti or anywhere else where the manufacturers can go set up shop. Why should they pay Canadians 10 or $15 an hour when they can pay people in this country, these countries 50 cents an hour and freely make the clothes and freely ship them into Canada to undermine and, and get rid of our own uh, manufacturing industries? It, it makes no sense except to the people who run the world because for them it's win-win. And it's now being exposed, this ideology of globalization is, is now being exposed as the emperor who has, has no clothes. But the key part of the free trade agreement was signing away our energy resources. We have an abundant supply of energy in Canada. It's, we're a cold country. We need to have that uh, ener energy. And energy was one tool that we used, could have used, to compete on the world stage with the Americans and with everyone else because we've got a cold climate, the Americans have a warmer climate, they have lots of uh, cheaper operating costs, but one thing we had was energy. But by signing this agreement, guaranteeing that we're going to give the Americans the same proportion of any energy good that they were taking even before the shortage, right now the Americans are taking over 60% of our, of, uh, of, our, uh, of our oil, and even if there's a shortage, we have to still give them 60% even if we go short ourselves. That's what the free trade agreement says, and I'm not aware of any other country anywhere in time of peace signing away its resources in such a sweeping way uh, to another nation. But this is not well known. Uh, the facts and what's in the agreement are not well known. That's partly why I wrote my book, which has become a bestseller. Mr. Trudeau called my book a masterful treatment of the early history of Canada. When it came out, it was very generous, and, and it's now translated into French. And people are reading it because uh, they still don't know today about some of the background and why we're paying these prices for energy, why we're losing our industry industries, why this, this, uh, this uh, uh, takeover of, uh, of, of, uh, of Canadian companies. So, so my book traces the, the, the struggle that we've had to hang on to, to build industries in Canada and to hang on to our independence. Because if all of our industries are owned from south of the border, we end up finding out we don't have much political independence uh, either. Remember after the attack on the World Trade Tower uh, in, uh, uh, in New York, the, the, when the border was closed down, there was this cry and some from Canadian prominent people, some Canadian premiers and others were demanding that we get rid of the border altogether because we couldn't survive in Canada if the border was shut. So they were ready to throw away our sovereignty as a nation because we've become so reliant on that uh, U.S. market. Now, there's nothing wrong with trading with the U.S. That's fine. We can trade with the U.S., but we have to keep the levers of our own destiny in our hands. And, uh, and I'm advocating strongly that we have a policy that 
allows Canadian companies to flourish and to and to uh, compete on the world stage. You can't do it when you've signed agreements like that, saying that uh, we're going to tie our hands and give away our in our, our, our energy. Um. I'd just like to just follow up on this whole thing of, of how we've lost so much in these in these deals like NAFTA, which most Canadians, you know, uh, they're, we're just not told about them, the, the truth of them. There used to be the Auto Pact, for example, which said that for every car sold in Canada, a car had to be manufactured in Canada. Now, the Auto Pact disappeared under NAFTA because you couldn't have those kinds of deals anymore. And now we're in the position of giving, we've been giving for years, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, now it's billions of dollars, to the auto industry. So to beg them to keep manufacturing cars in Canada. We used to have a deal that mandated that for every car they sold here, they had to make one here. All gone. Yeah, that was uh, that was gotten rid of under the original Canada-U.S. free trade agreement, and now, now we're seeing what could happen. We could end up with uh, these companies, American companies, all going bankrupt. But the main decisions, of course, are going to be made in the United States that are going to affect Canadian workers. It's going to affect uh, our economy, particularly in Ontario and Quebec. Whereas if we had a Canadian automobile designed and built here, then the decisions about it would be made in Canada. And that's the same if we had a, a Canadian farm machinery industry or if we had a Canadian shipbuilding industry. You know, we once had ships built on this coast here and ships built on the East Coast as well. It was after the Second World War, we were the world's fourth, had the world's fourth largest shipping fleet, merchant marine. We built those ships. Now we're going offshore to buy our ships. BC ferries. BC ferries. Uh, to Glenn uh, uh, Campbell's, uh, to uh, to Glenn Clark's credit, he tried to uh, design. He got a, a ferry that was built and designed here, but he got so much flack over it. They now they end up where's BC Ferries buying their ships now? Germany. Yeah. So uh, and the uh, BC companies were not even allowed, as far as I remember, to uh, to compete for the contracts. Yeah, I, I rode on one of those fast cat ferries. I liked the ferry, and uh, and uh, and in this idea that oh, you could save a few pennies by buying it somewhere else, that ignores uh, all the benefits that come from having the work done here, the industry owned here, and even if there were some wrinkles to work out of the first uh, the first few ships, any country that's built a major industrial uh, presence has worked through its wrinkles. I mentioned Toyota taking 35 years. The original Toyota cars were not very good uh, products, but the Japanese government had a policy of, uh, of, of fostering its electronics industry, its automobile industry, and now look where it is in terms of the world uh, stage uh, in, the, in those industries. That's a country with, that has very f few resources compared to a, a, a giant like Canada. Who, who, are, who are our politicians working for? Well, we've, you know, in the past we had this uh, system where corporations could give donations to political parties and, uh, they, uh, and finance uh, their, their operations. And uh, the old adage, he who, he who pays the piper calls the tune, uh, is a fairly accurate one. Under Mr. Kretchen, to his credit, he prohibited corporate and union donations to political parties on the national stage. So now political parties have to rely on the citizens for their funding, which is a giant step forward. But these companies still have a great deal of power and clout, and so and they're highly organized. And uh, that's why I've been calling on people to step into the political process because the citizens have to have a voice in, in those political parties. And that's why you know I joined the Progressive Conservative Party in 1998 to run for the leadership of that party, and some 10,000 people uh, joined. They took a $10 membership, and they put me in, in second place in that, in that race. In fact, out here in BC, in both my races uh, for the PC leadership, I was ahead of all of the other contenders because I had a very strong base of support here, here in BC. And in that old PC party, we were able to get a number of changes and policy uh, planks in place. We, we got a platform calling for the labeling of all foods that contain genetically modified organisms. We got a... Another that was in the Progressive Conservative yeah. Party. Yeah, yeah, and that was a result of people coming in through my leadership race, raising these issues from the floor, debating them. We had another one that we would review NAFTA for its impact on the, on the, uh, uh, the environment. So those are things that we were able to achieve. And then in the end, some powerful people got very frightened that I was going to win the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party and it got dismantled. This is our oldest, our f oldest political party, our founding political party in Canada, was simply 
taken over and merged into the Canadian Alliance, which is a you know, right-wing uh, uh, version almost of the U.S. Republican Party. So there was no more place for me there, so that's when I uh, accepted the Liberal invitation. I joined the Liberal Party, and I've asked people to join with me so that we can uh, work hard to bring democracy and uh, into the into the party and so there can be some kind of a voice uh, that uh, that people can uh, uh, where people can have a, a chance to uh, to bring some of these policies forward so I think it's important that people participate in the political process if we're going to make any changes that there's no other way that I can see that happening other than people uh, becoming informed joining the political party of their choice I happen to be in in the, in the federal liberal party and, I'm, and if enough people join we can make changes there but that's the only way that I can see uh, us being able to make the changes you've got an important initiative here with this uh, vote on proportional representation that's coming up uh, if we can if that can pass in one province that would open up uh, Canada to a much more democratic uh, representative so you'll see the representation you'll see uh, the voices, the political parties, that we won't have these lopsided majorities uh, uh, when the party doesn't get a, ma a majority of the votes. For example, we got the free trade agreement uh, under Brian Mulroney. He didn't get the majority of, of the votes in that 88 election, but there were two parties opposing the free trade agreement, the Liberals, the NDP, and they split the vote, and Mr. Mulroney got in with just 43 percent of the vote. If we had some kind of proportional representation, the way most European countries have, it would be more uh, democratic. I'd say we're far from democracy. What about uh, the issue of a free press? Uh, what do you think of the media in Canada? Well, that's another big, big problem uh, here. Uh, We've got a mixture of public and private uh, media here. We've got uh, the CBC, which is publicly owned, but we end up seeing the CBC operate in many ways. Uh, the, uh, the government is, is, is cutting the funding, is down, uh, downsizing and dumbing down the CBC uh, and all kinds of programs. Uh, it's still the best in terms of getting out a lot of information to, 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 to people, but again, it's only going to be kind of public pressure that's going to uh, save What that. do you think of the corporate media? In well, Canada, the, the corporate it? media, as you pointed out, uh, many of the, uh, the, the, the issues don't even make it onto the pages of the corporate media because, uh, uh, because there are certain uh, uh, things that maybe the owners want to have uh, 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 broadcast and certain things that they don't. And that's why we've had a number of royal commissions in this country on the issue of media concentration on, and how you have a press that's more democratic in terms of getting, I mean, many of the ideas we've talked about here today aren't getting exposed in the national media and people aren't getting to know what's uh, uh, what's happening in terms of genetically modified organisms in terms of free trade in terms of nafta these issues are crucial issues for people's personal health crucial issues for for our survival uh, on the planet and crucial issues for our sovereignty as a nation so there's very very uh, uh, serious problems with the existing uh, media structure we've got david i'm afraid we're out of time thank you so much for doing the interview and thank you very much for watching i've been talking to david orchard you can uh, get to his website at davidorchard.com that's right that davidorchard.com and i've got a toll-free telephone number okay. too it's one eight seven seven we stand as in we stand on guard for the okay one eight seven seven we stand thank you for watching uh keep these issues in mind because they're of prime importance for all of us thanks again and goodbye